Okay, well, we are going to go ahead and get started here. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy schedules to um, learn a little bit and talk about uh, steel fiber reinforcing and floor reinforcing options in general. A uh, couple of housekeeping items I want to uh, cover first. So um, if you do have any audio or video issues watching today, we do recommend using Google Chrome uh, browser. So um, if you're not already using that, might be good to switch over if you have any issues. And if you continue to have any problems, please just let us know in the chat and our moderator uh, will troubleshoot that with you. We are recording this session and you will receive a link to the replay after we're completed. Uh, for those of you uh, structural engineers on the line who would like continuing ed uh, PDH credits, please do email me or Ray. I've put our email contact info in the chat. So um, please reach out so that we can get you those uh, certificates. Also, um, we are going to take questions at the very end of this session. This is a total of 45 minute time slot. So we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So feel free to write in any questions along the way in the chat. And then at the very end, we will address uh, all of the questions or as many of them as time will allow. Um, we'll follow up by email if, if we do run out of time. Um, for any of you who have not been able to attend the previous three sessions, I've put the replay links up in the chat as well. So feel free to grab those uh, now if you want to go back to any of those as a refresher. All right. So with that, um, just real quick introduction for myself. I'm Claire Gandy. I'm the technical sales manager with our steel fiber reinforcing uh, team here at Beckart. Uh, I'm based in Atlanta and I've been with the company for about a year and a half. And it is my pleasure to welcome Ray Fate, our newest team member, been with us for about a year, based in Ohio. And um, Ray, with that, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you, Claire. Um, as Claire said before, uh, everyone, uh, this is the uh, fourth of our uh, webinar series. So for those of you that have attended all four of them, uh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, but you might see there might be a little bit of overlap in uh, a couple of the slides in here. So you might have seen it once or twice before, uh, but uh, you'll see it again. Um, so I'm just going to get right off and start for you guys. Uh, so, like we said, uh, this is number four, session number four. What I'm really going to cover is uh, Dramic Steel Fibers and uh, just comparing it against other reinforcing options that are out there in the market. So, first things first, reinforcing in your floors or no reinforcing in your floors. What are you going to do? Um, what are your plans? Really, when you're coming up with a slab on grade, there's really only three options out there for you. Um, you could go with your typical unreinforced floor, uh, something that's going to be lightly loaded, uh, something you really don't have to worry about uh, much heavy traffic going on. Um, you know, when you start to get into something that's going to have, going to have some more loading involved, uh, typically, um, and this is what's been used for you know decades, rebar or welded wire mesh. Um, and then uh, more recent to the market are fibers. Um, and that could be in seal form or uh, synthetic fiber form. So the first thing I'm gonna cover in this talk is just your, your standard, um, typical unreinforced slab. To look at it before anything, you have to look at really concrete as a whole. Now, concrete is fantastic when it comes down to compression. You know, you could put as much as you, you could put a lot of weight on top of it and, you know, it, it'll hold up. Um, the big problem is it comes when it comes to tensile strength. Um, concrete is okay at it, but not fantastic. It's, it's more brittle. Um, you know, it always goes back to those three tenets of concrete that you always hear. You know, there's three rules no matter what happens with concrete. You know, one of the, all three of these things are true. It's, you know, concrete, it may take a couple days, but concrete's going to get hard. Um, concrete's going to crack, number two, and number three, concrete, you can't steal it. Those are the three three main things we always know about concrete. Um, and just like this, like I said, cracking, it's because of its brittle nature. Um, that's why it cracks. So why, why do we do reinforcement in concrete then? Um, if you can build an unreinforced floor, why do we do it? Well, well, 
the principle of concrete reinforcement is, is it actually gives it more of a ductile behavior than concrete. So, you know, ductility is more like it's more of a metal kind of uh, physical characteristic. It's kind of able to bend. Um, so that's what the con the reinforcement does in concrete. If you don't have a reinforcement in there, it maintains that brittle nature. You put the reinforcement in there, it actually gives it a little bit more ductility. So you've got your typical unreinforced slab here. We'll just say this is, just for the sake, it's seven inches, okay? Um, so what you have, you have your typical slab, you put your saw cut in there because you're planning on, you know, the slab's gonna crack. So you put your saw cut in there and you're basically controlling where you want that slab to crack. Um, so the crack cracks through the slab. The problem is when your slab starts to crack and it actually goes all the way through the slab in an unreinforced slab, you're taking that one slab that you had and now there's a crack all the way through it, you've actually created two separate slabs. So they're kind of acting against each other in different ways. You don't have, you've designed for one slab, now all of a sudden you have two slabs. And that's only if you have one crack. The more cracks you have, the more independent slabs you now have on that floor. And this is kind of like a graphical rep representation of what it is and just kind of shows you the plain concrete's brittle behavior. Um, what we have shown in that top graph is basically just a standard slab, okay, a slab of concrete, and that red arrow is a load. So we're just going to assume the load is um, not the ultimate load, which I mean is the most load you can put on the slab before it fails, but let's just say it's the ultimate load minus a pound, okay? So we put very heavy object on that slab in the middle of the slab, and what it does is it creates both a positive and a negative moment, okay? Um, so what does that mean? What does that mean for a slab? If you look at that bottom left hand corner slab, uh, that's just your typical slab on grade, like a soil supported slab, you know, slab just on the ground that you pour on the ground. Um, so you've got that load, you're putting it on the slab, that yellow arrow. And what it does is it's, there's a linear response. So the more load I have, you know, it's going to linearly respond with a deformation on the slab. Okay. Now the one on the right is a little bit different. Um, that's like an independently supported slab or um, object. Uh, you know, it's like a beam, okay? So you don't have anything underneath it. It's kind of supported on both sides. So you don't have like that soil component underneath like the one on the left. And oddly enough, you know, it acts the same exact way. You've got, you know, you put that load on there and it's, there's a linear response between the deflection and the load. Now the big problem is, so I've got that ultimate load minus one pound. What happens if a truck drives by on that exact spot or I throw another pallet on top? Well, with plain concrete, it's going to fail. And what we mean by fail, it's going to crack. You know, it's going to crack all the way through the slab. And then once one crack happens, you know, you're going to get multiple cracks to the side. What we're doing right here is we've taken away all the positive, uh, positive moment. Now we've created all negative moment on the slab. So what does that do? What does that mean? If you've got a standard slab on grade or a, you know, the soil supported slab, yeah, you can put more load on there, but now it's not that linear response that you had before. The more load you put on that slab, the more deformation is going to happen. So say one more pound of load is going to create more deformation than it would have before that slab failed. Um, now, what happens if we've got ourselves in a situation where we're in the simply supported element? Well, I mean, it's a beam. If it cracks all the way through, it's done. It can't hold anything. You can't even hold the initial weight you had on there because you cracked the beam. So that's what that's showing right there. So now that we've kind of covered, we've went through relatively quickly, you know, why we would actually need reinforcement, what it does for you against unreinforced floors. Let's go to what's been used, you know, for decades now, you know, and, and you see it on so many jobs out there. It's the rebar welded wire mesh, okay? So why do we have it in? Once again, we show it's, uh, you know, it, it's there to create, um, you know, a more ductile concrete. Um, and, and, and there's many different reasons why it's in there. Sometimes when somebody's doing a design and you're doing a design for a slab and you're just designing for temperature and shrinkage, um, they'll put welded wire mesh or rebar in there. And then, you know, if there's a flexural component, a flexural uh, uh, limit that they have to reach, uh, they'll also put rebar and welded wire mesh on there. And um, just like everything we design, you know, uh, we tend to be on the conservative side. Uh, we like to take it to the limit plus, 
uh, because we never want to have anything fail, right? So that's another reason why rebar and welded wire mesh are used. And of course, you know, it's been used for so long. People just don't want to change. You know, you're comfortable using it. So even if they don't know why it's going in there, they put it in there, right? If you're looking at like a, uh, a drawing, uh, you can see there down at the bottom, it's just your typical slab on grade drawing. And it just kind of lays out, you know, this is what you would see if you're uh, looking at a drawing and they're going to be calling for rebar. Um, this one's just calling for number three rebar at 18 inches on center. But it's just a, you know, a standard when you look at a drawing. One thing with uh, rebar, though, that it does require, it, recover, it requires concrete cover. Um, it require, requires concrete cover on the bottom, and recovers, it, it requires concrete cover on the top. Uh, you can't just have rebar sitting on top of the slab. It's not going to do anything. Uh, you can't have it sitting on the bottom of the slab. It's not going to do anything. Um, you have to have cover on either side. Um, that's where Dramic Steel Fiber, that's where we really come in where it's really nice. You know, you don't need that concrete cover on steel fibers because it's all the way through your slab. You don't have to worry about it. Um, so what that allows us to do, when we're designing a Dramic Steel Fiber slab, we can do one of two things. We can take the design approach one of two ways. We can either take the slab and thin it up, okay? If we're going for the same load, load factors that we had designed with the rebar, we can thin that slab. And uh, so basically you're getting the same load, uh, but a thinner slab, or, or we could keep the same thickness on the slab and actually increase your total capacity so you can make a stronger, more durable, uh, better slab. Uh, one of the other big things uh, when you have, to, you have to worry about with uh, conventional reinforcement or rebar, um, you know, if you're in a factory environment or like a warehouse where you've got racks um, and then you have to you have to, you know, bolt them into the floor, you have to know where your rebar is. Um, so you either have to plan around it uh, before you do it because you can't bolt into a piece of rebar. It just won't work. You know, it's going to the bolt's not going to go all the way in um, or. If you don't know where the rebar is, say you purchased the building from somebody, you don't know where the rebar, or the reinforcement was, uh, you're going to have to go into that slab. You're going to have to cut the rebar. Then you can bolt it afterwards. With Dramex, you don't have to worry about that. It does not matter. You can change, you can change the uh, location of your machines, the racks, as much as you want. Somebody can come in by that building. It doesn't matter where the reinforcement is because the reinforcement is Dramex steel fibers. You can just bolt it right into the floor wherever you want to. No reason, no worries, wherever you're gonna put the stuff. Um, now this, uh, this kind of goes back to what I was talking about with the uh, concrete cover on the slab. Um, if you've got uh, standard rebar or uh, welded wire mesh in a slab, uh, really you're reinforcing, you know, a length and a width in the slab, okay? You don't really have so much of a depth, okay? It's a really two-dimensional reinforcement. Whereas if you look at uh, the, our, our, our steel fibers, those go in and they're going every direction. You know, they're going up, down, left, right, sideways, diagonal, everywhere. They are all through your slab. Um, the, the way I like to think about it is this. You can go into your backyard right now. You can go grab yourself a nice long stick. I don't know, half an inch wide, you know, half an inch in diameter. Throw it on your kitchen floor. Now go out and grab uh, grab a thousand toothpicks and then throw it in the air. Which one's a lot easier to clean up? I can just pick up that stick and throw it back outside, but I'm going to be finding those toothpicks like two years later. All right. So it's the same exact thing, the same exact principle with the steel for steel fibers. We're in reinforcing the entire slab. So really, once again, you know, property is the same in all directions. And this just goes back to, and we've all seen this. If you if you say you've never seen this, you've never been on a job site. Um, this goes back to the concrete cover. You know, there's so many times that human error, you know, it's not installed correctly. This is just welded wire mesh sitting on the, basically sitting on the ground and they poured a concrete slab over top of it. That is doing absolutely nothing. It's not reinforcing your slab. That's just a waste of money. It's just a waste of time. Another thing with steel fibers as opposed to like a rebar is uh, the crack, uh, resistance of cracking and crack propagation. So, you know, when concrete begins to crack, 
it, you'll have that crack and it'll be small. It, you know, you won't even see it for a while, honestly. And then it will start to start to grow, start to get bigger, bigger, bigger with the slab. The concrete reinforcement, it will get quite big until it actually gets to the rebar. Um, so you've got a pretty big wide crack that is eventually going to have to be repaired. It's going to have to be filled. You're going to have to do something with it. Whereas with, with fibers, uh, you've got that crack in there and it's actually going to be holding that crack together before you even see it occur. Um, so it's really going to stop that crack propagation. So it's Joint deterioration. This is this might be the biggest overall headache for a for an owner of a building is joints uh, because you've got wheel traffic going over and over and over these things, you know, thousands of times, hundreds of thousands of times sometimes. And the joint, if you've got a standard reinforced floor. The problem is, once again, you've got that concrete cover on top that is unreinforced. It's not reinforced. So once that joint starts to go, it's going to continue to go and get bigger and bigger and bigger until you eventually reach that rebar down underneath. What's that going to do? Well, one, it's going to start to ruin your tow motors. It's going to ruin everything that you're driving over top of it. And two, you're going to eventually have to cut that out. You're going to have to either put a ton of joint filler in there. And that's only going to last for so long before you have to pull that up and put more joint filler in. Or you're going to have to pull that whole joint out. You're going to have to re-pour that joint and then fix it. With Dramix, once again, we're fully reinforced. That whole slab is reinforced, so the joint is reinforced. So if you're driving over and over and over that joint, well, the edges of that joint are reinforced by fiber, unlike it is with the standard rebar and welded wire mesh. Uh, corrosion resistance, this is a question we get all the time. Uh, we do, you know, steel fibers, do they corrode, do they corrode? Well, we all know uh, rebar tends to corrode sometimes. And then when it does corrode, it, uh, you know, the rust expands and it starts popping out on the concrete. So you get pop-outs everywhere. Uh, with the steel fibers with Dramix, uh, the nice part is, yeah, you can have one that might corrode where they're so small uh, they're not really going to do anything. You're not going to notice them in your slab. They don't have enough power to pop anything out. And they're not continuous. So if you have one that actually, you know, starts to corrode, it's not like all of them are going to corrode because they'd all have to be touching in the slab for it to corrode. Whereas rebar, once again, you know, you've got a couple pieces. All those rebar, they're touching each other. So once you start to corrode and process, if it does occur on a rebar, um, it's going to keep happening unless you cut it out and you repair it. Time savings. This is this is a big one. This really is. Uh, when you look at uh, putting down all the rebar, uh, you know it takes a lot of labor. It takes a lot. You've got it. You've got to move it. It's not easy to move. It's heavy. You have to move it. You have to cut it. You have to chair it. You have to tie it. And then once you get it done, then you have to worry about being able to pump and pour and everything like that around all the rebar. Whereas when you have a mix with Dramic steel fibers in it and you don't have the rebar around, really you're just pumping and go, you're just, you're just pumping your concrete or pouring your concrete and going. You don't have to worry about any of that. Another nice thing is with the steel fibers, you can use a laser screed the appropriate way. There's no hassle at all. It just goes fast concrete placement. And you know, if you're lowering your overall time on a job site, all the heavy machinery that you have sitting around for a couple of days, cranes, pumps, all that, you don't have to have them there as long. Uh, you can take them off the site a lot earlier. Now this just goes, it just shows you uh, one job that we have done, okay? This is just an example of a job that we've done for General Motors. Uh, this is 250,000 square foot job. You know, most contractors, they say they can pour about 25,000 square feet a day. Uh, this was done 250,000 square feet in 33 hours, start to finish. That's what fibers allow you to do. Safe job site conditions. Uh, this is, you know, it's sort of tough to measure that, 
But once again, you know, you don't have the rebar down. So the trip hazards moving heavy rebar around. I mean, we all know you walk around a slab with rebar and you have to stick your feet in between the squares. You know, you don't have to look for that anymore. You don't have to worry about that. And then this just goes to show you kind of everything that I just talked about there. You have that, that picture of somebody trying to move a big sheet of uh, welded wire fabric there up in the uh, top left hand corner. Um, and I was talking about access to pouring areas. You know, you just don't have to worry about all that rebar sitting on the ground all chaired up. You can pour anywhere. You can drive anywhere. Uh, and overall time savings, the execution is faster. It's just, it makes things a lot easier on the job. This is just a little quick comparison of a job that we've done, a 500,000 square foot manufacturing job, okay? This is a standard 10 inch slab, 4,000 PSI mix, 15 foot joint spacing. Took 20 days for construction to do this job. So what we did is we took the approach of thinning the slab. So we were able to thin the slab. We kept the same compressive strength. We actually got a higher moment capacity, meaning it's a higher loading level, a uh, higher ultimate loading level you can have on the actual slab. Kept the joint spacing the same. Um, if you've attended Dan, uh, Danny's presentation on jointless floors, we're able to do that as well. But just for the sake of this uh, demonstration, we kept joint spacing the same. And uh, we took uh, the uh, 20 days of construction down to 17 days. So just a quick tally mark there. Um, inch thinner on the Dramic slab, same strength, better moment capacity, same joint spacing, took three fewer construction days. On this job alone, the savings were over $350,000. So now that we've covered unreinforced floors and we've covered the traditionally, uh, traditionally reinforced floors, uh, well, fibers, we're finally on the fibers, right? So let's talk about fibers. Now, here's another question we always get, you know, are all fibers the same? No, no, all fibers are not the same. You cannot do a one-to-one -one dose. If somebody calls in and they say, hey, I've got XYZ manufacturer going at 23 pounds per cubic yard, can I say the same for your Dramic steel fibers? No, absolutely not. Because we do everything based on design, right? Not all fibers are the same. So ACI 360 does mention fibers and it mentions the uh, two different kinds. So there's steel and there's synthetic, right? So steel, there's actually a classification for steel fibers and I'll get into that a little bit later. And it's ASTM 820 and there's five different types of steel fibers, okay? Now on uh, synthetic fibers, there's two different kinds. There's the micro synthetic and macro synthetic. They're generally, you know, plastic polypropylene. Now fibers, what do fibers do, right? We've talked about kind of why we would have fibers against traditional reinforcement, but this just goes to show you again, what does it do? You know, it all comes back to, to tensile and ductility on the concrete slab. And what it does is it adds ductility to the slab, right? It adds toughness to the overall slab. If you have a crack, it holds that crack together. If secondary cracks start to occur around the crack, which will happen with slabs, this will stop the seven secondary cracks from forming anymore. This holds stuff together and adds ductility to your concrete slab. This is your little standard beam test. Uh, if you've seen flexural beams, which are... Uh, Trust me, they're fun to move around. Uh, they're quite heavy, but it's kind of like the, uh, you know, the uh, the slab that we showed, that kind of independent slab that was elevated. That's how you test it. You basically put a pressure right in the middle of the beam and you try to crack it. And then you create this little toughness curve down, down below. So you will see stuff expressed uh, for concrete if you're looking at flexural strength in a couple different ways. And there's the equivalent flexural strength, which is essentially the basically that area underneath that curve, right? And then you've got a toughness ratio, which is an RE3, which we like to use. And it's just your, uh, it's basically your EFS over your um, flexural strength of your beam, okay? So your equivalent flexural strength over your flexural strength. It's just really a ratio. Now, ACI 360, this calls out, if you're using a yield line analysis to design a slab, this is what you need to use, the ACI 360. Okay, and that's how we design our slabs. We design it off the yield line. What it calls out is you need an RE3 of 30%, okay? Otherwise, you won't really be able to optimize your slab at all. So if you're below that 30% line, 
you can still design a slab, but you really can't optimize it using the yield line approach. If you're above that, you can use it to optimize your slab. If you look at the Dramix, even at the low dose, we have three separate doses there, low, medium, and high. Even at the low dose, we are well above that 30% called out by ACI 360. All those down below, one of them is actually a, uh, you know, a, a, a competing uh, type one fiber, a competing type one fiber, the Dramix. Even it took all the way to the high dose for it to even just barely get above 30. You've got a, a market leading uh, polypropylene fiber there, a macro synthetic. Even at that high dose, it's only at 25. And then you look at the type twos, the type twos, even at their high dose, they're not even close to 30. So you can't really optimize the slab with those. And uh, once again, you can just go back, fiber reinforcing. Um, it just goes back. Uh, this is maybe used a yield line method, which I just talked about. It includes soil interaction, joint spacing, ultimate loads. And if you look down below, I, I did one for, uh, you know, standard reinforcing. But if you look at a drawing and it calls out for fiber reinforcing, it's basically kind of laid out like this, like a six, this is just a six inch thick lab, 39 pounds per cubic yard of the Dramix 4065. Now that I've kind of just covered fibers, let's get into the uh, micro and the macro synthetic fibers. The macro synthetics are usually longer. Well, they are longer, usually made of polypropylene. OK, so you've got that and they're micro synthetic fibers. They almost look like a, they're really thin. Um, they're short. They're kind of furry. It's almost like uh, sometimes it almost like looks like you cut a bunch of cotton and threw it in a bag. They're monofilament. Now, why would you use them? Where would you use them? Microsynthetics work well in the plastic shrinkage reinforcement. So when, you're, when your concrete is still in the plastic state before it starts to get in a hardened state, that's where it works. So it helps in the, you know, the, 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 the plastic shrinkage cracking and that kind of stuff. When you start to get into uh, you know, further along in the concrete puring, pro puring process and you're making a non-load bearing slab, like a standard, like a driveway, a sidewalk, something like that, that's really not going to take a lot of load or a lot of load a lot of times. Uh, that's where you use, start to use your macro synthetics. And they'll also work well in like mines, you know, uh, shotcrete, that kind of stuff. Uh, where the steel fibers, the Dramix steel fibers comes in, you can use them in load, non-load bearing uh, applications all the way up to really heavy impact, heavy fatigue, structural reinforcements, crack controlling reinforcement. And I mean, it could be used in lining, uh, tunnel lining as well. Uh, we get this question a bit, um, are fiber slabs hairy? Well, sometimes they are. If you look at this, this is a standard, you know, uh, specific gravity chart, macro synthetic fiber, specific gravity tends to be around 0 0.9, 0 0.91. We all know water's at one. Uh, so what happens when you have the macros in a, uh, in a mix, they tend to float to the top, tend to migrate their way up to the top um, and come up with the paste. So then you see them on the top of the slab. That's where you get that hairy appearance because they're at the top of the slab. Well, the steel fibers have a 7.85. Uh, specific gravity. So we're looking at, you know, eight times that of a macro synthetic fiber. Now, the other question is people have, well, okay, since they float and yours is 7.85, will they drop down to the bottom? No, they don't. They'll lay down, but you've got so much aggregate and everything else in that concrete mix, uh, they'll stay suspended. They'll be all the way through your slab. And this is just a trial slab. Uh, we've got a galvanized Dramix mix. We do have galvanized Dramix um, for, you know, if you really need something in an external environment. Uh, and then a macro synthetic. And you can see the galvanized Dramix, you don't see anything on the surface. And uh, the macro synthetics, you know, started to pop up towards the surface. Because just like I said, you know, the specific gravity will tend to float. They can come up with the pace. They'll be in the slab, but a lot of them will tend to come up to the top of the slab as well. Now, this is just a typical, you know, a Young's modulus curve with concrete. And it just kind of shows you. So you've got that, uh, once that Young's modulus, once it hits about 1450, which is the synthetic fiber Young's modulus, you know, you're in your plastic shrinkage reinforcement at that point. So the uh, synthetic fibers are doing a lot for you in that, in, that, in that case, okay? But the problem is concrete gets past the Young's modulus of 1450. 
it actually approaches way over at 4350. When you're above that 1450 part, the synthetics really aren't doing too much more for you at that point. We're still, we have it at 29,000 Young's, you know, 29,000 on the Young modulus scale, 29,000 KSI. So it's, concrete can never even come close to approaching, you know, where, where steel is on that. So it's constantly, constantly working for you in your concrete mix. So now we've kind of covered micro and macro synthetic fibers against steel fibers. Now we're going to get into type 2 steel fibers. Now, Dramix is a type 1. We see a lot of type 2s out there. What's the difference between everything? So type one's a drawn wire. So that's what the Dramix is. So it's basically a wire and they keep drawing it thinner, 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 thinner. And that adds a lot to the tensile strength of wire. It adds a lot to the tensile strength of anything. That's, that's, that's how you, you gain a lot of tensile strength. Now type two, which we see a lot out in the market right now is your slit sheet. So it's basically a sheet of metal and they go around and they cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it. So if you look at a cross section and cut the wire, um, type ones are circular. And uh, type twos are usually a square or rectangular. Now there's type threes, which are melt extract and type four, which are mill cut, which I've personally, I've never seen them. I know they're out there somewhere. Somebody's probably, uh, one of you on the call has probably seen them at least once or twice. I've never seen them personally. And then there's type five, which is a modified drawn wire, which I really don't see either, but you know, they're out there. What's the big difference between type two and type one, as opposed to just what I just showed you, how they're manufactured, how they're made? It's the, it comes down to tensile strength, just like I said. Tensile strength is so much higher in the type ones in, compo in comparison to the type twos. So type twos, they'll give you the crack control um, because they're on both sides, but they don't give you a flexural capacity. If we go all the way back to that ACI chart that shows the 30% RE3, where the type twos are below that 30% line, you can't optimize a mix with them because they're not giving you any more flexural capacity than you would have gotten normally. So the type one, it allows you to have lower dosage rates as a comparison to the type two. They're usually higher dosage rates. Um, type two is designed typically as a plain concrete mix. Uh, type ones, you can, you know, you can thin that slab up. Type twos, you really can't. They're less cost effective when it comes down to it. And this just shows, uh, this is a typical, this is a type two jointless solution to Dramix, okay? This is, you look seven inch plain concrete. Let's just say there's none or there's number threes at 18, 80, 18 inches on center. It doesn't really matter. Um, but saw cut spacing 14 foot mats for that. You got your slab capacity at 13 kips and your slab capacity at the saw cut is eight kips. If you go to the seven inch spec jointless job with a type two steel fiber, you're gonna have to go in there with 65 pounds per cubic yard on this mix alone. Yes, you can get your construction joint spacing to 124 feet, but look at the slab capacity. Your slab capacity is 13 kips, just like you had with the threes at 18 or the nothing. And then, well, you don't have to worry about slab capacity at a saw cut because you don't have any saw cuts because it's a jointless slab. Now let's look at this uh, Dramix 4D slab, which is a type one. We went from a, 30, a 65 pounds per cubic yard dose of the type two to a 37 pound per cubic yard dose of the 4D. We kept the joint spacing at 124. Our slab capacity now is no longer 13 kips. We made it to a slab capacity of 44 kips. So it's a much better performing slab because of that tensile strength, because of that added flexural strength, as opposed to the type two steel fibers. And slab capacity at the saw cut, once again, it doesn't matter because it's a, it's a jointless slab. There's, there's, there's joint space even at 124 feet, it doesn't matter. Now, finally, the last thing here and the last section on here before we get to all your questions is the Dramix steel fibers, what I've really been talking about the entire time, comparing it and contrasting it against every other reinforcing way. We've covered this cold drawn type one steel fiber. It is a type one steel fiber. It can replace your traditional reinforcement in concrete. Three dimensional, very important, every which way. It's always in your slab, no matter where you are. 
I've talked a lot about floors because we, you know, I work a lot in the, on the, on the floor side and a lot of us work a lot on the floor side and we see a lot of floors come through for designs and, and warehouses and that kind of stuff. But can it be used in other stuff? You know, do I only have to use ceramic steel fibers on floors? No, 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 not at all. We use it, you know, it's used in precast all the time. It's used in structural applications. It's used in tunneling. We have a very large tunneling component to our company. Um, it's just not floors. Uh, it's just not for crack width. It's just not for controlling crack width. It's for everything. You can use it. If you've got concrete going somewhere, you can use ceramic steel fibers. So why dramic steel fibers? This is what we get down to. This is the this is the the meat on the bone at the end of the presentation here. Optimal load bearing. We've we've covered this a bunch. You know, you can put we can design slabs to just take more. We can take more load onto a slab than you can with anything else. And we can design for it because we use the yield line approach. Optimal crack control. It just holds it all together. And once again, it's just like stitches on a cut. It'll hold it all together. Keep that track crack from propagating, from getting bigger, or even forming. Fatigue resistance at the joint. It's all the way through that joint. It's reinforced because we have we have dramic steel fibers all the way through there. And impact resistance. If you keep pounding, 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 pounding on a traditionally reinforced floor, you don't have any. Once again, you don't have any reinforcement in that top part of the slab. So it's gonna it's gonna start to fall. It's gonna start to pop out. Ceramic steel floor, you've got you've got you've got fibers all the way through that slab. So you can keep pounding on that slab, but it's still reinforced at the top, reinforced in the middle, it's reinforced in the bottom. Now, what's our coverage like? Uh Dramix North America, we do have we have seven storage facilities throughout the country. Uh, we have one manufacturing plant out in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, we have a capacity of 6,000 tons capacity at the uh, manufacturing facility, and we do have a focused regional support. So we've got down there in the southeast is Josh Lee, and Josh Lee did uh, the uh, first presentation of this webinar series. And then you've got in the northeast in Canada is uh, Danny, and Danny did the uh, jointless floor uh, presentation, just uh, the one, the webinar right before me, and uh, I'm the Midwest and the West. So basically, I have Ohio and West Virginia all the way to Hawaii. So uh, we do have a regional focused uh, support. Uh, average one is what, three to five days material delivery. It really depends where you are. If you're in Michigan, we can get it to you pretty quickly. If you're in Seattle, it takes a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, we've been in North America for 40 years. Uh, we have 320 million square feet of floors reinforced with Dramix worldwide annually. And what do we offer? Production and supply. We can get that for you. Product quality and consistency, it's always the same. Everything, if you're gonna or if you order Dramix 4D 6560 BG, I can guarantee you if you open one bag and pull one fiber out, it's gonna be the same as the fiber you pull out of the last bag. On-site support, we have uh, Claire is an engineering manager. She helps out a lot. All of us regional sales guys, if you guys need on-site support, we will be there for you. We will help out. We will make sure the pour goes well. If you have any questions, we can be on site for you and help you out And technical support. We're always there helping. You have any questions, you give either of us, any of us a call, we'll answer. Uh, we can help you out with designs. We can help you out with pricing. We can help you out with everything. So that's all I have uh, for presentation wise. And uh, I wanna really thank you guys for sitting through all this. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll just open up the floor to questions now. I think Claire will start uh, firing them off, uh, whatever we have. Awesome, thanks Ray, great job. Um, few questions, sorry, a few questions have come in. I'll start with the first ones that we received. Um, Laura asks, can Dramix 5D galvanized fibers be a possible option for industrial floors to prevent corrosion or are they more suitable for different applications? Uh, yes, they can. Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the reasons we have the galvanized fibers, especially, you know, they're used outside a lot um, if they're going to use them. But yeah, they're there for uh, corrosion resistance. And, and I'll also just add, you know, just tacking on to this, sure. Laura. So it's 
kind of unusual to see a 5D fiber in a typical flooring application. We do tend to see the 5D fibers get used in more of the structural projects or a floor on piles. Um, a structural mat foundation might be where a 5D fiber is used. But when it comes to galvanized fibers, that's usually in cases where it's really sim uh, aesthetically sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, because with the corrosion risk with a galvanized fiber being reduced, but it, with a bright fiber that isn't galvanized, really your, your main risk is actually just a rust spot. Um, you're not going to have any kind of spalling or damage to the section. Uh, what you could just have is a, a small visible stain on the, on the surface of the concrete that would tend to wear off with normal Kind of foot traffic so to speak so um this is one of those things that we would work with you to evaluate you know what's the ac acceptable level of, of risk to that and what would be the appropriate solution um someone says yes that question is very important <laughs> okay <laughs> indeed it is yes um, Perfect. So Philip asks, if I wanted to design a slab with your fibers, what tools or assistance do you provide to help me? Well, we do have a slab on grade software that we do use uh, that sometimes we do. Uh, we will send out. But of course, if we ever sent that to you, you'd go through training with Claire. Claire would show you how to use the tool. But uh, generally how we work at first um, is you would contact either me or Claire or whoever your local regional sales guy is. And um, we would work through you with the design. We get load factors, everything like that, throw it into our software, and uh, we could send you the calculations and everything. And if you wish, we could walk you through it too. Um, but yeah, we have plenty of tools available and that's that's generally how we treat it. Absolutely, and, and just I'll speak to that as well because that's a huge component of my job is working alongside with specifiers to make sure that you understand exactly what type of solution we're offering. So I do lunch and learns. I you know, can provide training on using the, the software, on the technical aspects um, of, of using you know, the, the fibers in your design. I review specs, you know, the, the whole thing. So we really want you to think of us as like an extension of your, your design team, so to speak. Um, and, and we wanna make sure that everyone is completely aligned from the technical specifier side all the way through to execution. Great question. All right, Martin asks, how about composite metal deck for elevated structural steel applications? What is your suggested fiber of choice? Well, we do, we, we do. We have quite a bit uh, composite metal deck applications that we usually they're like on self storage facilities and stuff like that. Um, but we'll do 4D fibers usually on those, um, depending on what your reinforcement is. Um, sometimes it could be a 5D as well. And um, we are in the latest uh, Volcraft and Verco composite deck catalog. So um, you can see some fibers in there. I think right now it might be showing 3D 6560 fibers, but that's actually gonna be changing over um, to the 4D fibers uh, with the next revision. And, and if you would like the, the latest copy of that, you can email Ray or myself mm -hmm. and, and we can yep. email that to you. All right, great questions. David asks, what would be the difference in load capacity between a 3D and a 4D fiber? Well, it, it, uh, numerically it's tough to call, but um, uh, 4D are usually higher. Um, well, they are higher. So you can design sometimes a floor with, with 3D fibers or 4D fibers, but generally what happens is it's more cost effective to go to 4D because the overall dosage is going to be lower than that of a 3D fiber. All right. Um, what is the average dosage needed per cubic meter or cubic yard? That is, uh, well, that, that, that's, that's almost a nearly impossible question to answer, but I'll, I'll talk my way through it. Um, so there's so many different applications that you'd use to fiber. So it really depends on what you plan on using it for, because if you're using it for, say, I mean, even the, the different types of fibers, I mean, if you're using a structural application as opposed to um, we're just going to try and uh, replace welded wire mesh. You could be anywhere from 13.2 pounds per cubic yard up to maybe 50 or 60 pounds per cubic yard. So it's really tough to tell. I mean, generally speaking, 
I mean, on everything I've done, usually I'm somewhere between 20 and 40 pounds per cubic yard. But once again, you could be on either side of those really easily. And so for for our folks in the, the metric system, usually on average between maybe 10 and 25 kilograms per cubic meter average. Um, but like Ray said, we, we really, try not to publish, you know, an average or, or what you should expect um, from a dosage standpoint, because we want to optimize every design project specific, right? What's the soil K value? What's the loading? What's the joint spacing? What's the concrete strength? And all of those factors will lead to an optimized dosage recommendation. We're not just pulling something out of the box mm -hmm. that one size fits all. Um, we have an emphasis on what would be the difference in load capacity i think that that's oh did i miss it the difference in load capacity between 3d and 4d fiber no we we covered that mm -hmm. yep, so, we yep so so just adding on to it right the 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 main difference between our 3d and 4d and 5d fiber line it has to do with the tensile strength of the steel and the anchorage right the extra bend segments in the ends of the fibers so you will see a, a noted difference in the individual tensile capacity of an individual fiber but again we want to look at it as a composite you know the whole sfrc as a whole what's the dosage what fiber is being used and so on a uh, couple more questions here is there a big difference on sustainable production between con conventional method and dramix fiber in terms of durability and material or metal needs well, as far as uh, is, is, if you're going pound per pound steel reinforcement, your standard rebar against that of uh, steel fibers, you knew you use way less, first of all, uh, to answer that part. So there's way less steel fibers in a pound to pound comparison to get the same type slab. And as far as durability, um, this just goes back to some of the other uh, the pictures that we talked through. It's just uh, with the steel fibers, there's a higher impact resistance. Um, you're not gonna have to repair your joints near as much. Uh, you don't have that joint deterioration. You don't have the cracking where you have to repair. So it lasts a lot longer too. So I'm noticing that we're right at time here. Um, I personally can stick around uh, for mm -hmm. a few minutes to answer because we do still have a number of questions. I don't know, Ray, if, if you have a few more yep. minutes. Yeah, and I do. Then, so any of you on the line, if you need to go, um, you know, we if you have any questions, we can um, reply to you directly to um, any questions from here. On, we'll just send everybody in, uh, or send you directly an email on that. Um, so the next question is for wide bay applications, what special considerations do you need to adhere to as far as a concrete shrinkage characteristics? Uh, well, yeah, you do have to worry about concrete shrinkage because um, you know shrinkage is what leads to cracking uh, on your on your overall slab. So shrinkage is also going to kind of uh it's it, it might drive what your joint spacing is going to be as well so if you have a slab that's going to shrink a lot you don't want to have your joint spacing really really far out because the problem is with joint spacing far out it's going to cause curling and cracking issues um so if you have a, a slab that has a propensity to shrink a lot you're going to want to tighten up your joint spacing and, and adding to that, you know, we we take it all into account if, if we're doing a jointless floor design, we want to select the correct joint assembly. Mm -hmm. We're going to recommend a checkerboard pour sequence. We're going to work with the specifier and with the ready mix to hopefully have a, a slightly lower shrinkage mix, right? You don't need a shrinkage compensator in the mix to deal with this properly. So again, it's coming back to planning and just overall, uh, you know, being aware of what your options are, making the right choices and working together as a team for everything to come together. Um, great questions. In um, ULC ratings, floor slabs usually show welded wire mesh. Is there a UL rating for steel fibers? <laughs> Uh, well, we do have a lightly reinforced floor that we do have. So we have the basic different sizes of the uh, welded wire mesh where we can just go off the chart and actually uh, it'll give you a, a dosage, a standard dosage that you'd use for a couple different types of steel fibers. And, and tacking on to that, um, mm -hmm. certainly we do have the UL rating for uh, our composite deck applications. So um, that's 
also taken into account, for example, in the Bullcraft catalog, uh, the UL rating is also in there. Um, Phil, I just replied to you. You said you missed uh, about how to get your continuing ed certificate. So I just emailed, or rather I chatted <laughs> back to you so you can um, email me and, um, and Ray and I will, will get you guys your certificates. All right, perfect. Well, I think that's it. Um, I wanna thank you all again so much for joining today. We really appreciate your time and your wonderful questions. Um, have a wonderful day. Thank you again, and we hope to talk with you soon. Yes, thank you.